Hi, this is Dallas Moeller, Senior Application Engineer with Tektronix. I'm going to give you a brief tutorial on how to make jitter measurements on a Tektronix Windows-based oscilloscope. Things you need to do before making any measurements is make sure you have your acquisition set up properly. There's a video you can find on setting up your acquisitions that will explain vertical resolution, horizontal resolution, and D-skew. I've done all those steps, so we're going to go straight into the jitter. Basically, we're making sure that our acquisition channels, channels 1 and 3, are using 80-90% of the acquisition window, so that we're vertically full. I've got a high sample rate. I've grabbed enough time to capture the low frequency content I'm interested in and enough repeats of my pattern to do jitter separation. And I've de-skewed the channels. Now that we're looking at channels 1 and 3, I've got decent symmetry that gives me a good check of my cables. And we've noticed the skew. We can turn those off and just look at the math waveform, which is the differential definition of channel 1 minus channel 3. The vertical resolution of the math does not matter because it's data based on that real acquisition data. So now we can go to analysis. So to analyze the jitter, we go to the analyze menu and we go to jitter and I analysis known as DPO jet. You could pick the one touch jitter wizard and it will do everything for you or we can go in and select stuff manually. In the jitter tool, we can go in and see how the jitter breakdown and the jitter separation takes place. So there's the traditional spectral method which Tech has done for 15 years and we've also added in since then the spectral plus bounded uncorrelated jitter. If you have crosstalk and you have a broad spectrum mix the crosstalk will show up as, it can get binned as the non-periodic jitter and it will be binned here instead of being binned in RJ which it would be in the spectral method. So if your RJ is artificially large the bounded uncorrelated is a good place to check. I'll also show you a plot where you can see that if it does exist. So doing the spectral only method we can go in and we can pick the random jitter, the deterministic jitter, the total jitter which is a combination of these. Underneath the deterministic jitter there's periodic jitter data dependent jitter and duty cycle distortion. You can pick all of them, none of them it really is up to you what you pick. And if you wanted to we can go back in and say you know what I want to do the dual Dirac version of the deterministic jitter at the same time and we'll show you both numbers the peak to peak DJ measurement or the RMS dual Dirac number based on a dual Dirac model fit. So once you have those you can verify the source in this case we're doing all the measurements on Math1 which is the differential source. The tool is flexible enough if we wanted to we could turn on these measurements multiple times and we could have any of the channels mass or references applied to those. So I could do the plus which is channel 1, the minus which is channel 3 and the math independently if I needed to do that for debug purposes. So now that you've got your measurements selected I'm going to add in the TIE which is the time interval error. It's the base measurement that we do for a lot of the spectral separation and I add that because I'm going to show you a great plot to help you debug with. Once you've got your measurement selected now you can do some things to configure those. If your data was clock like, i.e. it was two ones two zeros but it is data, if you tell the package it's data it will get treated as data jitter not clock jitter. The thing you typically only have to worry about is the clock recovery. This is a USB 5 gigabit, USB 3 5 gigabit signal. So we need to pick an appropriate clock recovery. You have the ability to do multiple clock recoveries simultaneously in DPO Jet, but we're going to go with I know it's USB 3 and I want to test it for the standard. So I pick standard and then I go grab USB 3 5 gigabit out of there. And when I hit applied all, that put that clock recovery behind the configuration for every measurement because again this measurement system is flexible enough I can actually use different clock recoveries behind these. An example of doing that would be doing a TIE measurement, doing a second one and in the second TIE measurement instead of having it use the same one that everybody else used I could use a constant clock mean. So some examples. So if we look at the plots, some of the most 
useful plots. Your jitter measurements are only as good as your clock recovery if you're trying to correlate with anything else. So if the clock recoveries are the same, you have a better chance of correlating. You only know if your clock recovery is set appropriately if you see an eye diagram. So it's good to look at an eye diagram when you're doing jitter measurements just to get a feel for is the eye going to be open, is the clock recovery doing its job. The bathtub curve will tell you the distribution of the deterministic and random jitter and how they look and how it's going to extrapolate or estimate over time to a bit error rate. The jitter composite is also a very valuable one. And if you look at the TIE, the spectrum plot is one of my favorites. If I have crosstalk or bounded uncorrelated jitter, I can see it in this spectrum. If I need to find out why my jitter numbers are bigger than I expect, I can see those values in this spectrum. So this is a great tool for when you go to isolate and figure out your jitter components. We've got data in screen. If I hit recalculate, that processes the data already in the scope screen. And we have our numbers. If I want to trigger and get new data, if I hit single, that arms the scope trigger for whatever it's already defined to. When that trigger is valid, it comes back and processes that data. So we're processing that, and we can see again we have 5 gigabit pulling in this compliance pattern. Now that you have all your data, we've got a tool in here for reports, so you can quickly configure and get the data you want. You can add your comments, so you can tell it the device under test, what specifically you were looking for if you're trying to isolate a problem. And once you have that, you can tell it where to save it off, and you simply save your report. This goes out and it takes and sends all the commands needed to the system to go grab your scope screenshots, all the config configuration data, the configuration about the scopes, and it writes us an HTML report. We save it in an MHT format so you can open it on any scope in the world, but it gives you the scope name, the serial number, the firmware and app versions used, if the calibration is in a pass status, and you can go down here and see all the details about that. You know the reference levels at which the measurements were taken. So if you're trying to correlate this with another system, if someone made measurements at 100 millivolts and you made them at zero, you're going to get different numbers. But now you know why the numbers are different. Gives you the, all of the results. And you can open this up and see the different results for it. It gives you the summary plot. Gives you individual plots of your eye, your bathtub, your jitter breakdown histograms and that spectral plot and it also as important is you get a screenshot from the scope so if you have it zoomed in you get a screenshot of it zoomed you know what the scales are you know what the triggers are you know everything about that acquisition so you can have that information to repeat this at a later time so there's a quick summary of doing jitter measurements on the Tektronix oscilloscope and again this package is called DPO jet and you can use it on any of our windows based oscilloscopes